I have to eat this, I guess. Um, this is the session on how to have conversations with our patients. So my name is Teddy Potter. Um, I'm a clinical professor at the University of Minnesota. I am a nurse. Um, I'm director of the Center for Planetary Health and Environmental Justice at the university. And um, I, it is my honor and pleasure to chair clinicians for planetary health. Um, so why is uh, health um, care communication so important? It's important because it's about saving lives right now. It's going to take a while to mitigate all of these problems. And in the meantime, our patients and the people we care about and the communities we care about are struggling. And so we have to learn how to have conversations right now on how to protect people as we figure out how to put this roadmap into place. So this is going to be a very practical session, um, having a um, dialogue about uh, different examples or different models of how we reach uh, patients and communities. Uh, and then we're going to have some interactive time because we know it's an afternoon and it's nice to get um, active. So I, as I said, I'm Teddy Potter. I am a nurse. We have Nathan Oakman um, and all these people will uh, introduce themselves, but they're all part of our clinicians for planetary health. Uh, Raquel Santiago, and I think she's still getting hot tea, Tatiana um, uh, Sousa de uh, Camargo uh, is also getting hot tea, and uh, Vanessa is right here. So um, what I want to say um, is what a clinician is. I want you to hear that word, and I want you to um, hear yourself in this. Even if you're not a healthcare professional, if you've never done anything with healthcare, you are very, very welcome here. And those of you online, we welcome you into this circle. Even though you're scattered across the world, we feel you here and we invite you to participate fully um, in this uh, event as well. So uh, clinician is a very expansive term. It's basically people who care. So uh, we welcome you to this conversation and this dialogue. I think I'll give it one more minute uh, um, before I roll it over um, and we'll let people come, come in and check their badges and be able to participate. So maybe as we're waiting for people to settle in, how about how many of you are dietitians or work with nutrition? Ah, good. How many of you are dentists? How about public health? Great. How about uh, veterinary medicine? Um, pharmacy? Okay. Yeah. Nurses? Okay. Physicians or primary care providers? Wonderful. Um, rehab specialists like physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy? Okay, uh, traditional healers, great. Um, am I missing somebody? Okay, well, welcome, and we're going to um, have Nathan up as our very first speaker. Welcome. Thank you, Teddy. And welcome everyone. I'll probably do a little bit of a walking and moving presentation. And I do want to invite those who are farther back. I can kind of see you. We have open space in the front. So if you feel the spirits move you, you're welcome to come closer so that we can be more sharing each other's space. So the topic of my presentation will focus on how do disruptions of the Earth's natural systems impact health? And it'll be a brief and hopefully interactive and even a bit fun and playful review of this very complex question that's in a clinical setting is largely daunting and potentially overwhelming. So one of the goals that I have is to try and break that down into a format that is accessible and meaningful because ultimately what we're aiming for is behavioral change and a change in the value systems and even the power systems of how we relate as human beings to the natural world and also how we relate to each other 
as health professionals and in relation to our patients and community members. So just a couple of points to make. Uh, the first one, that we are all part of nature. I think that that is a theme that has been reinforced multiple times in very powerful language in many of the sessions that we've heard so far. So based on that, using a very technical linguistic approach, we could say, I could just stop speaking now. Because if we are a part of nature and we are recognizing that the earth is diseased and we're a part of the earth, then of course our health is also not in a good condition. But because we have several more minutes to go, I won't stop now and I'll continue, uh, but just want to make the points that I think uh, for patients, for community members, for our colleagues, that is something that even though it might be seen as simple, it's absolutely fundamental that in as many settings as possible, we reinforce this idea that nature is not separate from us and that if you're interested in promoting your own individual health or your child's health, your family's health, you need to be a steward of the natural environment and the spaces that we share together. So the second point is just reinforcing uh, that the language that we use and the way that we break down this terminology is very important to make it so that we don't focus on the negative or the abstract or the general or even something that induces fear. We, as the caregivers, try and intentionally position ourselves and make these concepts relatable, accessible, and even somehow potentially empowering. That even though the earth has many disruptions that we as human beings are responsible for, we can actively be agents of positive change if we join together. And so the language that we use is absolutely essential. The third point is that there are no cookie cutters. And so we come from many different parts of the, the planet and we have different issues, which are the most pressing, the most relevant in the local context. So it's important that we don't refer to experts or refer to written reports we are active agents of translating these concepts ourselves, and we should do that on a regular basis together with our colleagues, with our patients, with our community members, because this is a dynamic system. Earth's natural systems are constantly changing. Yes, we can quantify and predict many of the issues that will arise, but we need to be flexible, we need to be resilient, and to continually look at what it is that we can do to try and summarize, synthesize the most relevant information as we communicate to our patients and community members. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about a cultural context. And in many ways, this is expanding on the idea of the language that we use and how important that is. And so whenever we are intentional about acknowledging and appreciating our incredibly diverse planetary cultures, it is a pathway, a process that makes it easier for us to reach people where they are, to speak in even native languages and to speak in language that children and community members, regardless of your educational level, if you're intentional about trying to be simple and to break down planetary health into these universal concepts like air, and water and food, all of these are things which if we're honest about it, they can't neatly be categorized into either health or environment. So these are the nexus. These are the, the simple things that on a daily basis, we all know we need to breathe clean air. We need to drink clean, fresh water. We need to eat healthy food. And to do that, we need a planetary system that is healthy. And we also need that for our human systems and societies to be healthy ourselves. So we want to plant seeds of hope in the language that we use. And again, that's intentionally being sure that we are not falling into the trap of talking about just a climate crisis or planetary crisis in isolation, because that's disempowering, that's overwhelming, that's scary. And as human beings, we know this is professionals understanding human psychology, if we're operating from a frame of fear and scarcity, 
then we look narrowly and are more likely to be divisive and to think about human beings and animals, the plants, the natural systems. And even it makes it easier for us to be tools of politicians who want to put us into one side or the other and prevent us from remembering who we really are as human beings, homo sapiens who share one home on one planet. So should I be up here? Yes, okay. Sorry for uh, anyone who's not seeing me. So you got your little bit of time and now I'll try and be more for the, the camera. So uh, we have several sayings that I think reinforce this idea that some cultural sayings, just a few, uh, are very useful in terms of communicating these concepts. So the first one is, I don't know if this comes from any particular place, but just the idea that there is nothing new under the sun. And that says that our ancestors addressed similar challenges. And by and large, they overcame those challenges. They persisted and they made it possible for us to be here today. So we can learn from that and see that even though there are surprises uh, in nature that, we, that might keep us on our toes or, or make it so that we, we didn't anticipate this, maybe it's a, a 10,000 year flood or something of that sort, but we do have plenty of things that other people in other parts of the world and even our own people from our place have dealt with similar issues in the past. So that's one way to make it so that people can see that there are many patterns and that we can do this together. It's a hopeful framing. The next two, I want to invite uh, audience participation. Uh, so the, the first one in Swahili is Mtu Niwatu. And I would like to ask if any of our audience members, I know we have some Swahili speakers, but if anyone would like to explain to our fellow attendees here today what this Swahili proverb or methali means. Any volunteers? Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, hello, I'm uh, Dr. James uh, Crispin from Tanzania. So uh, mtu ni mtu ni watu. So I will have to explain this in uh, in an English version. Yeah, it's in, uh, what I'm from what I'm thinking. Um, mtu ni watu means you cannot be alone. We always need each other. Like the to be defined as a person is not about who you are. Is how you interact and live with others. Something like that. Thank you very much. That was beautifully articulated. And the the three words in Swahili, mtu is one person, ni is is, so a person is, then watu is people, the plural. So what I think this is useful for is uh, reinforcing that even though we are unique and uh, special and distinct, we're also parts of communities and the issues that face us as individuals are very common to our fellow human beings. The third point is uh, Ubuntu. So this comes from South Africa. And again, I'd like to ask if anyone is familiar with this concept or has an idea. Yes? Yes. Were you all able to hear that? I am because we are. So I think that this one became uh, maybe more recognized on the global level uh, with some of the issues that were facing South Africa several decades ago and how South Africa was able to, in some ways, navigate that transition in a very admirable way uh, because of the roots in community. And as was articulated, I am because we are. So even though that's kind of general and simple language, it reinforces who we really are, that we are not just individuals, we are a part of communities, not just human communities, but also a planetary community of life. Next slide, please. 
So here I want to talk about a couple of authoritative and established general frames which answer the question uh, that the, the presentation is focusing on about how disruptions of Earth's natural systems impact health. So I have a, a prop, you can call it, that we can pass around if anyone is not familiar with this book. So again, we're really just scratching the surface of some of these concepts, but it's useful to know about these resources in case you would like to look into it or purchase it or share it. I'll go ahead and pass it around. And maybe once it gets to the back, if we could just pass it forward. But this is a, a planetary health book uh, and it's protecting nature to protect ourselves. And the Planetary Health Alliance director, Sam Myers, who shared earlier today, uh, is one of the two editors together with Howard Frumkin. The other concept is in a diagram and a uh, triple planetary crisis is a framing that has recently become more widely recognized and used. Uh, so the three areas that are encompassed within the triple planetary crisis are uh, pollution, climate change, and biodiversity loss. So you could say conveniently enough, we can summarize this language in case you want to use this in a setting to talk to your colleagues about, especially how climate is not the only environmental issue. It also is lumped together with, it has a lot of overlaps, but by no means is it the only challenge that we're facing. Uh, biodiversity and pollution are also major issues that have some overlap. And we in the planetary health community, I think need to be aware about all of these major issues and do our best to align with and collaborate with uh, others who are experts in this area. So I have a few emojis uh, that's meds, bugs, food, ah, sad, <laughs> mental health, and then run. So these are just ones which, again, the playful language, which talk about how our health is connected to the health of the environment and how disruptions affect us. So next slide, please. So I had several vignettes, uh, which looks like I won't have time to share today, but it's really these do a local context and making it so that when you are in your own home setting, your home clinic and environment, you can break it down in a way that is clear to uh, as many people as possible. Last slide. Uh, just emphasizing the bi-directional nature that I think we as health professionals should not only understand from the, the general to the specific, how the disruptions in Earth's natural systems affect our health and human health, I think it's also important that we understand how our health as individuals and health professionals and community members, if we are healthy, if we are grounded and we understand these issues, we can do a lot to dampen and diminish these these areas, these crises, these problems in the Earth's natural systems so that we can be active agents of positive change in making it so that we have a harmonious balance between human and non-human and actively work to make the brightest possible future for all. I'll finish there, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because of my voice. And then I will try to speak very fast, not to expose you to all this noisy voice, okay? Uh, some of you uh, I met yesterday or in another space, but uh, to that that I don't know yet, my name is Raquel Santiago. Uh, here I I always said that if you call me Rachel or Raquel, it's okay, it's the same. Uh, I am from Brazil. I am a professor in a public university in the center of Brazil, and it was very good to see that someone uh, put her, the, her hand up to say that she is from the nutrition field. I am a professor in a, the School of Nutrition, and in the beginning of the course, 
and we are always trying, even if we think that nutrition in the past, maybe not, not now anymore, can talk with planetary health. Now we know that they are totally uh, involved in this field. Uh, so planetary health and nutrition are totally uh, walking together. And uh, I'm came, I came here to talk a little about um, why should health professionals talk about climate change with their patients? To be very directly direct in my opinion in what we are hearing here and what we are talking here, just because we need to act in every space we can. This is the answer, and then I can say, okay, goodbye, I finished my presentation. But Teddy asked me to tell a little more, so I will continue uh, talking about this. So joking apart, uh, Said, I will, uh, we need to discuss a little more uh, between us because we really know that we have a lot of uh, health problems associated with climate change. Next, please. So I put just a little here, and then you can, I won't uh, read them, but you can see that the impacts of climate change uh, on the health are really, really, uh, and very significant from the population for the environment. So we need to uh, put uh, our peers, our colleagues, uh, the people who work in health, on health, to see that this is a public health problem. The climate change need to be um, uh, the climate change and their consequence for health needs to be uh, divided with our colleagues and with our patients. So it's very important to think first uh, on it. And to do that, maybe the first thing we have to say and to talk is to the next piece. To show to, the, uh, to, to our colleagues and to all the uh, health people that is necessary to believe or just to open the ears and eyes and see what is happening around us, with us all the time. Uh, so they need, maybe after that, they can adhere or they can believe that we really have a lot of uh, health problems associated to uh, the these professionals. Then uh, it's necessary to train because in maybe in most of the schools of health professionals, they never heard about planetary health. So the insertion in the curricula of this STEM, that this, this field is an urgent action that we have to work on it to uh, avoid or to aware the people about the urgency of all these things, all the diseases associated with climate change. Even when we thought that there's nothing happen together or that the, the diseases are not influenced by the any of that uh, situations that are presented before, we can find some associations. The second process we have to learn after knowing and believing that we have something to do on that is try to listen more because we don't have time. I have to attend 10 patients in two hours because I have another job to do and I have another things just to do, but I need to listen and to see what people have to, to tell me because even for the patients to understand what they have and they are part of this process of uh, climate change and loss of connection between nature and uh, uh, human habits, uh, we have to show them. Yesterday, we had a very good conversation uh, in our group during the afternoon here with the people from Planetary 
health that we need independent of being teachers or not we have to teach it's our mission since we are part of this group what is happening of people who can uh, understand because generally when you said planetary health never heard don't know what this means what are you doing something in what we said yesterday interplanetary health planetary so that it's Associate you associate with what, but we have to listen and show to the person that said, "Oh, I had a problem. My house is very hot. I live in a space that I have to stay inside the bus in a hot way for three hours until arrive in my house," and show that that situation should cause a health problem and is totally associated with the way of life the person has. Maybe because of the traffic, maybe because of the number of the people living in urban spaces. Uh, is there any possibility that I can change? And sometimes we don't do this association. It's so when I can listen, uh, I can find ways to show to my patients to the people that I'm talking with and see better solutions together instead of just arriving with my evidences, all the things, all the papers I read and all these things that said, no, no, you have this and we have to do that and forget to listen what is happening with the other side of the table or of the room. Um, the next piece. And to do this, it's clear that... Uh, it's not easy because, as I said, first we have a traditional way of formation and of study and where we are always looking for more evidences, um, more traditional ways, not traditional knowledge, but traditional ways of treatment that everyone around the world do the same because this one is the best because the paper A, B, C or D said that. Uh, we have, of course, these evidences that are a way to be followed, but we need to do an exercise to consider the knowledge, the know-how, the traditions uh, that are brought to us to understand what is happening in that space, what is happening in that neighborhood that the person lives, and I am there attending a patient so have health professionals have to training that is uh, the 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 treatment should be more shared instead of be totally centered on the knowledge of the the doctor or the nutritionist or the pharmacist or even other professionals of health uh, or totally centered in the patient. It should be one thing that we can share knowledge, ancestral uh, knowledge again, and knowing what we can put together with all the evidences we have in the literature and all the things we learn inside the classes and uh, with our professors. So next. And for that, as I said, uh, maybe you, you are thinking something like that. What do you mean? telling us that we have to hear I can I need to attend 20 patients in 40 minutes we will we need to practice we need the evidence and with the practice and the evidence we will be faster in, in have this perception and share these experiences and and in some in some situations we need to say okay i will have to stop to this person and listen and spend a little more time with them because this person need me more than the 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 one who came before and talked to me so a scientific evidence is very necessary and we need to establish uh new challenges new discoveries, uh, respecting the scientific evidence, but trying to keep in mind that healers, that traditional knowledge 
are very necessary to con they were and they are still necessary to construct this way of life that we need to have better conditions of life with the uh, environment and the human in this planet that we need to divide alone one side or another we can't uh, do the best way it's impossible to do the best way uh, so this is these are some ideas this is not one uh, size or this is not one solution that fits for everyone or not this is not a recipe of uh, cake it's just a moment to think about and see what solution fits to my space, what I can do to help my patients, what I can do, how I can talk with them about planetary health, about their environment and how this environment affects their health. And so this is the way that each of one here, the students, professors, uh, researchers have to think about. This is only one moment, moment to ref to think about the things. And here again, the next one, please. I invite you to take action as I started. Uh, each one in the best way they can do this uh, in a way that we are capable to communicate and educate uh, considering all the situation that is involved in that place at that moment. Okay, thank you very much for hearing me like this and for being here with us. A little shorter. So I'm going to talk to you or share with you um, a study that we did in Minnesota. Minnesota is the land of the Dakota people and the Ojibwe people. Uh, we're located um, north of Chicago in the United States. That's sort of a landmark for everybody. So this is about um, the the uh, study was done to see our, um, how health professionals feel about talking with their patients about climate change. The same rules, same principles could apply to planetary health. We acknowledge, fully acknowledge that climate change is only one symptom of multi-system failure. We've got biodiversity losses. You've been hearing we've got our single-use plastics in the oceans. We've got uh, vector changes. Um, we have heat issues. There's just multiple, multiple issues going on. But this just is a demonstration of how we prepare our prof health professionals, our practicing health professionals, to have conversations. We also have um, planetary health curriculum that we're starting to work through um, our health professional education. But this is for health professionals already out in practice. Next slide, please. So we did, um, we felt that it's really important for our health professionals to understand how to have these conversations. Health professionals are the most trusted uh, uh, profession. People listen to us, whether we've earned it or not, they trust us. And so they will um, oftentimes hear messages that they don't believe their government is saying, or they don't believe um, what they hear in the news. But when their uh, doctor or their nurse or their uh, traditional healer says something, Thing to them, they listen and pay attention. So it's very important that we take on that role. Every single one of us that cares for people needs to take on this role. So the, at the University of Minnesota, we worked with our Minnesota Department of Health, our State Department of Health. We did a survey um, to understand, try to understand uh, what the values and understanding of, of current health professionals is. Um, because we wanted to know what the barriers are for them to do this work. Next slide. 
And we received over 4,000 responses nine, from 97% nurses. Nurses, I guess, really are good at filling out surveys. 87% uh, of women. Women are also really good at filling out surveys. Um, the average age was over 50, which I think is interesting. And the average year of, in, years in practice was 22 years. Next slide. So we wanted to know to what extent do you um, disagree or agree with the following statement, climate change is happening. Over 75% of our practicing health professionals believe that climate change is real. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement, climate change is directly or indirectly impacting the health of your patients right now. 60% are already seeing evidence that climate change is impacting the health of their patients. Next slide. Then when you think about the following categories or conditions, um, what are you seeing right now uh, uh, manifest in your patients? Uh, respiratory um, uh, alarms were showing up, especially uh, related to asthma, allergies, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, followed by mental health. Mental health is a huge issue related to um, health impacts of climate change. Um, and we're not just talking uh, chronic mental health, we're talking about eco-anxiety, despair, um, uh, lack of, of energy or hope for the future. Um, the third one was heat illness. Uh, the fourth was vector-borne diseases, seeing vector-borne diseases. And the um, fifth in our state was physical trauma related to emergency weather. In our state, it's um, we're seeing a lot more ice on the roads. People are falling and slipping, uh, where in the past we were a snow belt. We didn't have ice, we had snow. And so uh, it's a whole new skill set to learn how to walk on ice. Next slide. Um, we wanted to know um, if, um, if health professionals felt concerned. Um, so uh, how concerned are they about the impacts? And we found that 70% of our respondents said that um, healthcare, um, as a healthcare professional, I'm concerned about the health uh, impacts of climate change on patients. So they know it's real. They know that they're, um, they're seeing it right now. They know that this is their job. Next slide. And so we asked them, are you doing this? Are you talking to your patients? And the majority were not. So we wanted to know why. If you know that it's real, you know that it's impacting your patients right now, and you're seeing evidence of that, why aren't you talking about it? We suspected that it might be because there's not enough time, and you've heard that mentioned, or that, you know, they're not in our, the United States, they're not paid to talk about climate change or anything like that. The number one response is they did not know what to say. That was the number one thing. They wanted to teach their patients. They didn't know what to say. Next slide. And so what would be helpful? Continue education courses, research, um, uh, other patient materials. So they're very specific. They know what they need. So the next piece here is a video, and I'm going to have them pull it up off of YouTube. And let me just explain it for a minute. We created a video, a short 11-minute video, to demonstrate how you have these conversations, to make it safe for people to have these conversations. So I'm going to play the video. I'll play, perhaps, I think I can squeeze in most of it. If not, you'll get the idea about it. And thank goodness to... It was TJ, right? <laughs> TJ, who's the tech specialist up here making all of this possible. Welcome to this video about how to have climate conversations within a clinical setting. I'm Dr. Teddy Potter, a clinical professor and director of planetary health in the School of Nursing at the University of Minnesota. The World Health Organization states that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Yet far too few clinicians are talking about the health impacts with their patients. It's often said that with climate change, we're all in the same boat, when in fact, we're all in the same ocean, but different boats. A luxury liner will weather a storm differently than a canoe. Not everyone experiences the health impacts of climate change equally. Climate change amplifies health disparities so that populations contributing the least to climate change including black, indigenous, and people of color, suffer the greatest health burden. Climate change discussions can protect health by addressing existing risks, preparing patients for the health impacts of a changing environment, and encouraging stewardship of the natural world. 
but often there's a gap between the desire to talk about climate change and our comfort with the topic. In my experience, climate conversations can be easy parts of a regular dialogue about safety. For example, when I talk to my patients about the risks of smoking, I can then also talk about their increased risks from poor air quality due to wildfires caused by climate change. You don't have to be an expert in climate science to open a conversation. Through simple discussion techniques, healthcare providers can plant seeds of safety. This video will explore the structure of successful climate change conversations in three parts, on-ramp, dialogue, and off-ramp. First, my colleague, Dr. Taj Mustafa, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Minnesota, will demonstrate these strategies. In the following modeled conversation, the doctor has an established relationship of trust with the patient, and they use the conversation structure to connect the personal to the environmental and to the global. Perfect. Well, your lungs sound completely clear. That's great. I have phlegm in my throat when I wake up every morning, though, and my nose is still running, even though I'm using the spray. It's weird. It feels like my allergies have usually cleared up by this time of year. Yeah. Have there been any changes to your living situation? No, I haven't moved. I still don't have any pets. Well, you know, pollen's your big trigger. And with rising carbon dioxide levels, the pollen counts are getting higher, too. Carbon dioxide acts like a kind of blanket around the Earth, which traps in heat and creates those rising temperatures, which also creates a longer pollen season. I get that the climate's warming, but Minnesota hasn't really been affected yet, has it? Yeah, sometimes in the middle of winter it doesn't feel like it, right? But, you know, temperature is rising in Minnesota, and that has resulted in higher average temperatures in the winter, but also a longer pollen season. Ragweed season is three weeks longer than it was 25 years ago. But you know, it's not just what's happening here. Things that are happening elsewhere also affect us. The wildfires in California and Canada, those are happening more often. And you remember the last time when it was really smoky out, we talked about limiting your outdoor activities and really planning to stay indoors. No matter where you live, climate change affects you. So wait, is my allergy just going to keep getting worse and worse? Like, how am I supposed to live my life? Well, that's why you come to see me. So we're going to take a look at your medications today and probably make some adjustments. But there's lots of things we can do to control your symptoms, but there's things that you can do too. So when you think about planning your outdoor activities, being mindful of what air quality is like. You know, as a rule of thumb, after a rainstorm is a great time to plan to go outside because pollen counts will be lower, so will other particulates. And as you plan group activities, thinking about air quality is going to be appreciated by everyone in the group. You're not alone. We're all dealing with this together. You know, a lot of patients also find it helpful to be a part of a community of other people who are concerned about how climate's affecting their health. If you're interested, I can point you to some resources for further learning and potentially even ways to get involved. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Let's dissect this conversation, starting with the on-ramp. The goal of these dialogues is to show patients why climate change matters to their own health. Dr. Mustafa began with an on-ramp a natural entrance in the conversation that ties an environmental impact to health. In this case, she started by asking about the patient's allergy symptom, one of the factors that could connect to a climate health dialogue. Other on-ramps include respiratory concerns, heat illness, vector-borne diseases, water-related illness, and mental health. A recent extreme weather event also makes a great conversation starter. Providers should also consider the patient's livelihood. Do they work in construction, roofing, landscaping, or farming, where climate-caused heat or flooding could pose additional risks? Even when a patient is being seen for a routine annual physical, their hobbies, interests, and lifestyles can be used as on-ramps. For example, air quality can impact their recreation choices and tolerance. If they like to hike, camp, or spend a lot of time outdoors, risks for vector-borne diseases should be discussed. Discussion of these topics can merge seamlessly into the next step, the climate dialogue. After establishing a health topic, connect health to an environmental trend related to climate change. When Dr. Mustafa's patient described worsening allergies, she connected his symptoms to the longer ragweed season. Then she introduced warmer temperatures due to climate change as the root cause. Step by step, moving from the personal to the environmental 
the global. Climate change is complicated. Metaphors can help explain the science in an approachable way. One such metaphor used by Dr. Mustafa was the heat trapping blanket, which described the effect of greenhouse gases on the earth. Because most patients understand what happens when you pile on lots of layers, this metaphor shows how greenhouse gases act like too many blankets in the atmosphere, which trap heat and lead to changes in our climate. The all wrap you choose depends on the patient. In the dialogue we just observed, the patient expressed anxiety about worsened allergies. So Dr. Mustafa redirected towards strategies that empower a patient to take more control with positive action instead of falling into despair. With an activated patient, your off-ramp could be suggesting resources for further learning or ways to get involved with groups that support climate change mitigation or adaptation. Lastly, we'll see a modeled conversation with a patient who does not feel... Oh, I'm going to leave you hanging. You're going to have to go to our website and see how uh, Dr. Mustafa talks to a patient who does not believe climate change is real. She, that doesn't stop her. She has tremendous conversation, always focused on compassion and safety for the person she cares for, and it works. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues who are going to lead an activity. Thank you. So now... How can we do that? <laughs> um, to, to action, right? I'm going to say. So, so now I'm Vanessa Goyes. Um, I'm an integrative health professional, a dietitian, and I've also worked with well-being um, mentoring, uh, working in the uh, lifestyle medicine framework. Um, I'm also a dancer and I have been in the planetary health field for a couple of years now. Um, and within this field, I'm totally passionate about it. Um, and in this field, I have been working mainly with research and education. So I'm part of a few, um, you know, uh, projects and, uh, clinicians for planetary health is one of them. And also uh, the Mentoring Research Network uh, from ACOFI, an African organization. Um, well, the Food Detectives uh, also uh, is, is teaching uh, teachers uh, to include this perspective in their teachings for kids, uh, talking specifically about food systems. And, wow, well, maybe I forgot some, but... Uh, so uh, now the proposal is to uh, is an interactive um, thing. So I would invite you if you would like to come closer because you're going to participate. And me and Tati, uh, we are going to do um, like a showcase a ca uh, case, Roberto's case. He's from Brazil. Uh, is a real case. Um, and we are going to try to bring, um, you know, the concepts and to make you maybe start thinking about how could you act in your own field or, you know, practice. Uh, so uh, we were going to start in the first with the concepts, um, you know, uh, so, but we decided to change. So we are going to start with the case and then we are going to be linking with the concepts. But so, but it's nice to just uh, read the first thing, like different approach. And then you can move on, please. Um, collaboration uh, and enhance motivation. So we will go back to this. So I will call Tatiana now. She's going to present the case. But please uh, come closer, really, because we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, thinking together. So thank you. Thank you. It's working? Yeah. So, wow, moving, please. Okay. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah. Me and Vanessa, we planned this presentation first in this manner of concepts first and practice after. But today, and, and yesterday we talked, and today we finally decide to change this because sometimes 
starting by the the case and starting by the context the real practice is easier sometimes uh, it's easier to take to the concept so um teddy show here uh, amazing video and i love the video and uh from uh her group and i just uh, i Oh, I didn't present it myself. Okay. I forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, before uh, say what is this, I will present myself to you understand better. Uh, some of you were in my other side event about children, uh, planetary health education for children. So maybe you are wondering what sh why she is there also. So I'm Tatiana. Tatiana Kama. I am a biologist and the Associate Professor in Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, as a biologist, I always research about education and science education, and especially health education and health promotion. So within this field, I work with people that teach for children, and I work with doctors, nurses, psychologists. So thinking how we can educate in different levels about planetary health. So that's why I'm here. I work with children materials, but I also work with some students, PhD students that are doctors and are researching about this. So here I just brought this image I took from WONCA, which is the International Organization of Family Doctors. Uh, 2022, they proposed this campaign called One Minute for Our Planet. The idea is much closer to what Teddy presented, is how we can, within uh, the, the conversation with the patient, take one minute to talk about our planet. And this idea of one minute is to focus that it doesn't have to be extent. It needs to be simple. It needs to be context uh, uh, meaningful. So the idea is to, we, we, we need to understand that health professionals have this time to deal. So one minute uh, is, the the propaganda that doesn't have to take too much time and you could uh, engage in this movement also so let's try next please uh i will present a case a real case this is a case that comes from case studies uh collected in brazil by rafaela uh, which was a phd student where uh, in that uh, I was her advisor. She finished uh, her thesis last year and uh, is Roberto's case. Roberto lives in center Brazil. So this is a little spoiler about the case, but just to give you some, uh, some inspiration. Next, please. So Roberto is a cisgender, heterosexual black man, is 15, 55 years old and lives in Cuiabá in central Brazil, which is a region that uh, produces a lot of soy and cattle. The capital of the state of Mato Grosso, located in the Midwest of Brazil. He lives, in a, he lives near a large, very busy avenue with his wife, Ana Maria, his son, Miguel, and his mother, Romilda. He works as a driver and on weekends, he helps his cousin, on a soybean monoculture farm in Campo Alegre, an hour away from the capital. Roberto is used to dealing with agrotoxics, agrotoxics and even thinks that they are not as harmful as the television says. He always consumed a lot of meat and loves to eat barbecue and drink beer. Barbecue is very common in Brazil. He has always, no, sorry. He has grade three obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hepatic steatosis, and atopic dermatitis. Today, he went to the health unit with his wife because he noticed bleeding after bowel movements in five different occasions. This has become more frequent and the stools are much darker. He denies a family's history of diabetes, colorectal cancer, cancer and denies weight loss. The examination does not show any perianal abnormalities. So what can we think about 
Roberto's case, and more than the, we can say, medical or more clinical um, concealing that we could do, how we can connect this with planetary health. And now is the practical. What do you think? How, how you could start about this conversation with Roberto, considering his context, and with this idea of a simple message, one minute for our planet. How can we start? Anyone can try? Some elements. Uh, here is a, a diagram with some elements that we pointed about the case. So Roberto, um, he has diabetes, hypertension, obesity. He eats a lot of red meat, fried food, salt food. Um, and you could follow and think about how can we um, engage him with planetary health thinking. Anyone can try a way, an entrance? There is a lot of possibilities, just an entrance. Hello, everyone. So oh, yeah. we're going to... Um be asking uh, him about how uh, so he has come uh, with uh, which uh, condition diabetes and hypertension and uh, obesity and what are uh, his presenting complaints uh did, did he say something about it sorry yeah. uh, could you yeah yeah so he has always consumed a lot of mean and loves today leading, he lives a healthy leading diet, after bowel movements uh, okay yeah. after bowel movements okay uh so we would first ask him okay he denies a family history of diabetes cholera and denies weight loss the examination does not show any perianal abnormalities so first we will ask him about his lifestyle and we're going to be very polite uh, not to uh make him uh, offend about you know his obesity mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're gonna go slow and say that uh, as you know um, every um, increase in the BMI uh, leads to harmful effects on uh, diabetes and hypertension and if you lose your weight by taking a regular exercise you can start off slowly uh, with few steps, uh, like for 10 minutes initially per day uh, for four to five days and then increase it gradually. So exercise would not only take care of your weight and blood sugar because um, it will obviously make your glucose enter your cells and uh, you would not be put on that many medication. And we would like you to uh, control your hypertension and diabetes by lifestyle modification first before giving you. Is you already on antihypertensives or not? <laughs> so we we would. Uh, we don't have this information no, here. Yeah. So we would say that since you're not on, um, uh, you've been diagnosed with hypertension but not uh, been put on medication as yet. So we would like you to, you know, uh, bring it down with uh, exercise, lifestyle changes, behavioral change, and uh, uh, less of meat because it's not good for you as well as for the planet because of methane. And, uh, you know, uh, when, when you will adopt this change, uh, it will be, uh, you would be a role model for your children. And uh, obviously, your family would like you to be here for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, by adopting these measures, you would not only be uh, benefiting your health, but that of your families um, and uh, their mental health as well, because nobody wants their father or a husband to be you know, sick or um, not in a good uh, you know, um, shape uh, in in men mental uh, health because obviously you 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 get depressed when you see a bloody stool. I mean, mm -hmm. th this was his presenting complaint. So we're gonna run some tests 
and we hope there's nothing bad yeah. uh but uh, for, for for the time being we would request you to slowly bring down your you know diet tree habits and your sugar levels by sticking to a plant based diet you cannot do it like immediately but you can take small steps something like that i hope i'm wonderful right thank you nina <laughs> i will pass to the colleague that uh, asked it here but first i would i would just mention that hina brought us some uh, elements to consider um uh lifestyle and and food yeah connections with lifestyle and food consumption cons food consumption she uh tried to uh give him counsels uh, concerning his individual level but going also to family connecting even with mental health and um, making trying to making pointing these connections with planet so i will not give him more spoiler i just let you give suggestions and then i'll wrap up so oh, go. thank you very much very comprehensive approach of course uh, and the, the the issues that family doctors or nurses we don't have much time no and i understand that this is a comprehensive and of course we there is a potential cancer we have to screen many things but i would take advantage and say look you are 55 no and we live in a world where your diet is not very good no and the obesity aspect is important but not only that you are also in contact with potential no Toxics and the key, the key potential issue is the hep hepatic steatosis, which practically one quarter, one quarter of the population worldwide, seventy five percent of people have hepatic steatosis, no, slowly, no, because of diet, and this is like a key point, no. So why don't we start um, appointing some visits, regular ones, to start changing now that you are fifty five, because if not a cancer. It will be a cardiovascular event for sure. So I don't want to scare you, but let's take advantage of all these no planet approach, and uh, we have to take care of the stools, of course. But apart from that, why don't we uh, envision three, four visits in the next three, six, no, and start to change the habits? Because if you don't change it, or well, cardiovascular event, or uh, you know, will 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 kill you, maybe in five years, <laughs> maybe. In ten years, and and yeah, why don't we take that opportunity? No, and just in one minute. No, I don't know, but uh, I would say that to him. No, yeah, amazing. Thank you. You bring another aspect very important for uh, primary care. That is, uh, um, I forgot the word in in, in English. Just when oh. no, it's um, longitudinality. Yeah. <laughs> That is the, the idea that you have to keep this connection with the patient. And maybe it will not be in the first visit that we will have this good connection to start this conversation about the planet. But yeah, maybe in some visits, we will start to get more and more close and could uh, go to another levels of conversation and taking more elements of the context to put uh, put this one minute or this planetary health recommendation in a more adequate format, even considering ethic issues of not being uh, so prescriptive about uh, moral conductions or making people uncomfortable. So other, yeah, Mike. Okay, uh, thank you um, from the perspective of dietitian. Okay, uh, looking at this, uh, this patient is actually um, taking a lot of high calorie food. And as mentioned earlier, high intake of meat and as well as drinking beer. You know, drinking beer is very high in calorie. One um, CC provides you with seven calories. So it is um, mostly due to the, uh, not only the, the, the food intake as well as the physical activity which is lacking because he works as a driver and I think I believe the um, 
bleeding after bowel movement could not be because of the uh, this patient is um, there is no history of cancer, right? But it could be because of constipation, because when you sit down too long as a driver, you tend not to go to the toilet. Um, I think of long hours of driving, and I have seen patient in I used to work in the hospital, so I used to have this kind of patient where they are overweight, they sit too long uh, on the you know on the on the highway or what, so they don't stop. Uh, I mean. Uh, they, uh, maybe, maybe they don't have time. So it's the environment that they are forced to to be in. They have to live with that. And also um, in terms of consumption of meat and barbecue, all these things, it is uh, considered yeah red meat uh, based on experience also. <clears throat> meat, of course, because in terms of... Uh, 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 what you call that intake of meat, it will increase the uh, cholesterol level as well as the fat level, the LDL, you know, the TG in the blood, blood, <clears throat> blood um, uh, results. So it is connected there. So, um, yeah, of course, to encourage to take more on the plant based diet to improve the um, uh, fat. Uh, level the hepatic stetosis as mentioned there um, for the diabetes I believe because here it's not mentioned about sugar intake I believe he is also taking a lot of uh, sugar as well as um, uh, maybe high carbohydrate intake it also it might, might be because of the beer intake because of the calories carbohydrate there so um, yeah it, it, it involves a lot of yeah in the environment as well as the atopic dermatitis, I'm um, not. It could be because of the, as a driver, uh, yeah. When he went to the um, he's helping the cousin on a side monoculture farm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my suggestion is this patient needs to reduce weight to reduce the uh, diabetes as well as hypertension because as I'm, I'm sure all of us, you know, are aware that reduction of 10% of the weight will reduce all sugar of, you know, um, sugar as well as blood pressure as well. So um, I'm sure the rest will, you know, add, uh, in terms of the climate thing, then yeah, someone has to <laughs> suggest on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any anybody else? There's a lot of microphones. Thank you so much. I think the, the the three volunteers have raised lots of great um points. I think I I'm a I'm a doctor based in the UK, so I don't know if there's anyone any UK based doctors, but um I worked in general practice in primary care, and a thing that we use because we only have like ten minutes, um, which is so tight for time, you know, for like any um clinician, and what we use is called something called ICE. So ideas, concerns, expectations. And I think just exploring what Roberto's like insight is into his health, um, whether he's aware about his meat intake, you know, understanding what is important to him, like about whether it's family that's important, whether it's his health, um, whether it's the climate even, because, you know, like you said, like Brazilian culture, like barbecue is very common and it, that's the culture, isn't it? So understanding local culture is so important because we can address that and say, like, this is something that, you know, lots of people are doing and obesity is high in our country, but, you know, we can do things about it. How can we support you? Whether it's like social prescribing, whether it's prescribing you with like a dietitian to help with your diet or even like exercise volunteer groups to help support you if you're, you're in a stagnant job um, as a driver. So yeah, kind of things like exploring his inside. Thank you. Anybody else going to? Yeah. I'm interested in what the green space is around his home. Um, knowing that the time that you spend in nature, people who spend time in nature have decreased obesity, they have decreased blood pressure, they have decreased diabetes, um, they have increased their increased uh, immune system, which obviously the dermatitis could be um, connected to that. So um, 
in our country, we have the ability to look at people's nature score um, direct to their neighborhood. So when our um, young adult cancer survivors come into the clinic, we can say, go for a walk in your neighborhood. You have a really green space or, or your space in your neighborhood isn't very green, but within, you know, this far on the, on a, a bike lane or a walkable neighborhood or where it is, how you can get there on public transportation, or if you can drive, um, spending um, 30 minutes four times a week and then you take your mother with you and you take your wife with you and and you take your son and it increases the health and well-being of your family and then you are interacting with nature and then you care more for nature and then it cares you care more for yourself wonderful i'm in minnesota with teddy yeah <laughs> it, it is Good amazing to live. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Anybody else over there? I was wondering why your student uh, did that statement. Um, I'm not a clinician. Um, I'm from the IT space and as well as fa uh, farming. I did a, a postgraduate diploma in farming. And when I saw that, the first thought that came to my mind is here's a poor guy who has to work two jobs. And because of his second job, he's exposed to agrotoxics, right? Um, and it stated that it's monoculture. So perhaps, I don't know whether there's time in the conversation with the patient to insert 25 seconds to say, well, you're spending money on um, you know, all this toxic stuff, pest control and all that. Have you thought about going back to the traditional way of farming where you use integrated pest control and uh, biological control? And in that sense, you um, don't spend so much money on uh, all these pesticides and you safeguard your, he your health. So that's a kind of like non-clinical but integrated approach, yeah. Amazing. Thank you for bringing this. <laughs> yeah. More one. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for wonderful talks. Uh, it was a very nice input. So a lot have been talking concerning on the how the person is at risk and uh, with the lifestyle modification. I don't want to repeat again, but I wanted to add on how we can, uh, as a healthcare workers, uh, during work, how we can uh, make sure, like, uh, apart from imparting individual person, how we connect this to the family. So, for instance, uh, in actually in Tanzania, doctors with a thin rate of patient, we we use less time because the line is big. But I want also to emphasize on the ecosystem in the healthcare service. How do you co help each other between doctors and nurses? Because as a doctor cannot do it alone, and after the end of the day, it will bring a problem because you won't attend all the patients. So it's very important to have a good way of working as a team. Maybe to make things uh, easier. But for instance, uh, in this case, uh, this patient is uh, is already at risk uh, in Tanzania. We receive a lot of patients with uh, 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 non-alcoholic hepatitis and they present with upper GI bleeding. So in Tanzania, possibly I could think of uh, this patient is having a lot of hypertension and upper GI bleeding. But at the end, again, this patient is a, I think this patient is uh, having a lot of uh, comorbidities and and a lot of these uh, lifestyle are centered, but for the point of uh, hypertension, because hypertension uh, is uh, is very dangerous and it is high, it is high high mobility and risk to a lot of complications. So I could try to link this to the uh, global warming, which is we are really having and we are experiencing a heat stress. And among the consequences of a heat stress is uh, is hypertension, and also so I could advise. Uh, he can uh up on top of the family modification he can top he, he can they can try to um to be uh like advocates also in preserving their their environment at least to minimize uh, this global warming if they can uh plant it they can plant a tree and reduce some of uh, uh modifiable uh uh risk uh, behaviors uh, which are endangering our TV, uh, our environment so that the, the the environment could be clean and uh, having a yeah thank you um it was such an interesting conversation here with you because uh i had the opportunity to discuss roberto's case with different audiences and it's amazing to hear how the context of where uh from where comes your point of view changed the way you see 
the case and it's amazing it's expected but this see this happening is amazing so uh can you pass the next slide just to finish i will show you some possibilities that we had already discussed around this case so um following much of you said roberto diabetes hypertension obesity uh, maybe focus on this part of this diagram we could think much more about uh, uh, lifestyle changes and diet changes and uh, to engage the in this conversation the planetary health topic maybe we should the concept of co-benefits and saying to Roberto that maybe changes some things in his lifestyle or changing some things in his diet, not abandon the barbecue because, because if you say, Roberto, don't eat more bar barbecue, what will happen? Roberto will never come back. So <laughs> uh, it has to be considered this, this point. So maybe just think it's say, Roberto, maybe not not eating four day four barbecues at each month uh, start by eating three one less and this will be good not just for you but for the environment because red meat impacts and his region is a region with a lot of cattle ranching so this could be something meaningful thinking about this context but we have other uh, possibilities because we could talk uh, for example uh because we could go on different levels depending of how much we have the uh, uh, time and uh, longitudinality in this uh, uh, relation with the patient, considering Roberto's case. We could think more about um, the part of, you, you told something about uh, green spaces. And that's one point that we include in this case, that here is written as environmental racism, but we could call it climate justice because he is a work, he works in as a driver and in weekends he works. So uh, currently the workers, they don't live in the best places in the city. In Brazil, it's common. Uh, we don't have, uh, from Lancet countdown data in Brazil, we don't have any city that it's considered good in the green spaces level. There are just regular. And if you go to chapters that you go to the, the center of the city, to the most beautiful places, you could see a lot of trees. But what happens in Brazil is that the part of the, the richest part are the, of the city uh, have green spaces. But where workers live, they don't have trees. They don't have green spaces. So this is a fact and an element to consider in his case also how and how to deal with this and how to include this in the conversation is a very sensitive topic so, but maybe we could expand just uh, we could expand from this level of individual advices and go into a community and see uh, and advising him that uh, climate change impacts has has Steady says, I love it, the analogy of the, the ship and the canoe impacts uh, people differently and how it's important to consider this in his community because this community is more, much more vulnerable. So this is another way to put. And nobody mentioned it, the, uh, the dermatitis. Do you remember? The dermatitis is to come, is to... Uh, make this liaison, this connectivity with the monoculture and the use of agrotoxics, because the maybe the idea is that this dermatitis is coming from the exposition to agrotoxics. So is another way of connecting him is to talk about that this, this dermatitis has connections, use of agrotoxics that is severely, that, that has an intense use in monoculture and could be an opportunity to talk about this. Uh, it's difficult to talk about monoculture in this part of Brazil because much of the workers are not the owners of the land, so they need to work in this model. But talking, even talking about the absence of other options to work is maybe a way of introducing this point. So 
there's a lot of possibilities people i will not uh uh finish this line finish with all the possibilities i will pass to vanessa and then give her the opportunity to take back to the concepts yes so yes basically you can go to the first one <laughs> actually yes this thank you it's the first slide yes um yeah, it's just, I think, about the concepts, uh, it's very important uh, to, to talk about mindset, not only for uh, uh, the professionals, uh, but also uh, to the patients, because um, uh, values, like to resignify values is something very important for planetary health and to achieve some kind of change. Um, so... Um, um, the different approach is that we need to be in a different approach for our patients. And um, it's talking about comprehensive perspective, a holistic perspective, which is connected with the system-based practice. So it's basically, it's to understand that health is something broader that we have been understanding. Um, it is connected, the connections between individuals, environment, and every li living things. So this is the first thing to keep in mind. Um, and also to try to at least open this little, um, you know, window in the patient's uh, mind to do this. So with the diagram, we could do this connection uh, to, you know, amplify his uh, concept of health in many ways. So, um, so yeah, basically this. And then um, also, uh, to um, the low, the to focus on a low uh, cost preventive uh, things, which is like basically trying to work with what he's capable to change. You now his lifestyles, his behaviors, his habits, daily lives, his actions, because at the end, this is what uh, makes his um, healthy or you know not healthy. Um, and to do that, it's. It's very important to talk about values, uh, to try to to open the, his mind to that. So, um, next one, please. And so this uh, talks about collaboration, uh, and it's very important, uh, I guess, to step out a little bit of the you know the no the known one, the one that knows what to do, and to uh, listen more. Um, to listen because it's what what it makes the change is his understanding and his awareness uh, of his reality and what he can do. So instead of doing oh you shouldn't eat meat uh, anymore or nah, you should just um, listen to what he he ask him how how does he think that he could make it like what do you think you could do. Um, so it's like more than is uh is a collaborative is a horizontal uh, relationship. Now it's just like the doc the the health professional is like um you know uh, facilitating the change and collaborating with his understanding. Um, and also as we have been talking a lot in this conference, uh, communication. Uh, uh, so uh, educative for me, what I realized listening the the people talking here uh, is that education and co communication it's completely uh, you know linked. Uh, our communication should always be educative since we have so less time and we need action and movement and change now. So um, uh, keep this in mind and also also think about uh, the inter disciplinarity like it's not only him it's what he can do as individual with his actions and his choices uh, but also how can he uh, relate with the community his family or the place where he works how can he make like partnership with these people uh, to also uh, try to change including them uh, because then he could, you know, reach different levels, not only his own, um, you know, world. Um, next one, please. And enhanced motivation, I think, is the 
the the more important the thing you know because without that as you said i mean if you say oh stop eating your your meat your churrasco as we say he won't go back so uh it's very important to uh be empathetic and to create a, a desire within him to do something to move forward and to change his actions uh so empower himself to think about it and to do the changes and yes, it's true lifestyle. It's it's the only way that individuals could act really like, you know, of course, integrating your own, you know, people that are around you when you work and everywhere you go. Um, so, yes, I guess that's it because the time is over anyway. It's like infinite uh, conversation. Um, thank you. And if you want to add, yes. Congratulations, because this is, we need to have more advocacy, because the problem is that doctors and nurses are burned out. Patients are so are burned out. And the issue is that the value is care that you put there. Governments do not pay for making, uh, so for having education for diabetes. Governments pay to the surgeon that makes the amputation to the diabetic people. And if you look, and just to link it with your colleague, longitudinality, this is a study in Norway that says that people who is with a family doctor 15 years they live longer and less mortality. So basically, there must be advocacy between patients and healthcare workers together to tell governments, if you give me more time from 7 minutes to 12 for 15, I can explain people what they can do to improve the health style, and then you can pay us because of change behavior. If not, and it's a win-win for everybody, because if you are depressed and the doctor also is depressed, and the government doesn't pay you for improving your health style, we are all going to. So I think it's, it's, it's could be uh, all the power, the value based care that you put there, it's fantastic, no? And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We know that we have talked a lot and we wanna see if you have questions for any of our panelists. I'll ask you to use the microphone because we do have people online. So I, I want to. So thank you so very much. Uh, it has been a wonderful discussion. And uh, yes, clinicians need to be mindful that along with the prescription, they have to prescribe connection with nature and planetary health. Because at times uh, when a patient comes in, they're not aware of uh, this concept or why uh, connection with nature is important for them. So, and, and clinicians have a trusted voice. So patient, you're, you're, you're somebody who the patient is looking for, you know, in times of crisis or in times of sickness. So uh, they're looking up to clinician as a support, as a help, as an advisor. So that's the best time to, you know, uh, prescribe planetary health as well, along with the medical prescription. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I would like to, um... oh, yes, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, this question is uh, targeted to, I think, Dr. Rachel, um, in terms of uh, nutrition, uh, it was mentioned in slide before that about uh, food, inse uh, food security. So what are the examples of programs that you have done in your country or in your university that you have, you know, um, in relation to um, planetary health in regards to food insec insecurity? Well, uh, I will mention just uh, maybe one or two situations if you want to complete the post uh, after. Uh, uh, when you say it's possible. In Brazil, we have one guide, uh, the food guide for population, the Brazilian food guide for population, that it is exactly what I said about not mention the word planetary health, but all the steps for a sustainable diet. It is, this guide is this year, He's, it is completing 10 years and we have a lot of information that can uh, aware the people about planetary health without 
talking about planetary health, but we have a problem that the implementation or the how we can communicate this guide for the population. Because if I go to a class of students or professionals or, prof or teachers for uh, it is to teach kids and I ask about what you know about our guide or food guide for population, most of the people doesn't know. They don't know, they never heard about. And for, this is a very sad thing to say because it's a very good material to to spread, to talk about planetary health and to avoid, to, to try to avoid the food insecurity. And other, and we have a lot of programs, gov government programs like the Penai. It's a program for uh, kids, a school feeding that we should put, um, we have law to put traditional ways of production, agriculture, familiar, familiar agriculture to put the food inside of the diets. But uh, we never use this term planetary health. So we can talk with our groups and spread in different ways and little by little bring the word planetary health and so we can communicate better to the population. But because of the time, if you want, we can continue this conversation. Thank you. I'm going to... Oh. No, it's just uh, it's we we is one of my projects is called the uh, food detectives and it's also is is in the e the book uh, green growing green that is available online and so we, we made a, a course for um, fundamental teachers uh, for them to include in their in their you know approach with the kids. Uh, planetary health, food insecurity, uh, and we had like two editions already. Uh, so we are, we, it's just, I mean, it's very recent. We have like two years working on this. So this is a kind of a very good project I mean, uh, to introduce that. So we are dealing now with the government to see if we can implement that uh, in Sao Paulo, um, uh, you know, to start teaching the, the fundamental teachers to include that in their so it's a start is, you know, talking about of this. So I'm going to wrap up with a few key messages. Um, one is that don't be afraid to talk about planetary health. Don't be afraid to mention that. I am a um, was a cancer nurse, oncology nurse, and you can't care for people if you fail to mention you've got cancer. Then I was an HIV AIDS specialized nurse, and you can't care for people with HIV if you fail to mention HIV. Now I nurse for the planet. And I tell everybody I can about planetary health. The more we normalize that language, the more we begin to bring people hope that we have some solutions and direction to move in, the better it is. Take a look at the people around you in this room. Um, you are um, the healers in this space. We have government officials. We have business officials. We have people here who are representing different sectors. You are representing the health sector. And so it's very important that you find each other in the next couple of days, that you have conversations with each other, that you share examples of what you're doing. Show up to talk to your elected officials. They listen to us. The health argument is very, very strong. And they don't understand oftentimes health. They don't know the language. They haven't done the research. So show up to talk to your officials. And then finally, please join us in the Clinicians for Planetary Health at the, um, through the Planetary Health Alliance. Ursula, I saw her. Early. There she is. Ur Ursula is our wonderful um, outreach coordinator. Uh, she just raised her hand. She didn't say she was a health professional, but we have adopted her as a health professional because she cares deeply about the, the planet. So um, please seek her out. I'm going to put on the board here the link to the video. Feel free to use it share it with your your students or people you know and we're so grateful you're here we'll stay for a little afterwards so if there are additional questions feel free to come up thank you so much Patty just to mention here uh, is the QR code to that Roberto's case is in this book is part of this book. Uh, this book has another like 15 cases that are 
real cases based on real cases of Brazil. So if you want to know more about this exercise, please uh, check it. And Vanessa mentioned at Growing Green Hearts that it's an ebook for P uh, planetary health education for kids and teens. So this is available on Planetary Health Alliance uh, websites also. So a lot of materials. It's not materials is not the the problem now. Is <laughs> the yeah the action yeah. Thank you so much.